on your computer or messages on your cell phone. You're actively participating in a network that connects and estimates 5 billion people. It is known as the World Wide, the World World Wide Web. But despite... But despite the web size and impact on our lives, it's not the Earth's largest or most important mean, means that transmitting our massive resources of, resources of information. During the past 30 years, science has been revealed the wonders of another global network where fiber optic cables are replaced by tree roots, fungi fibers, and mushrooms. I love the nickname, the Wood Wide Word, the Wood Wide Web. I won't explain how this all happens, but instead, let this new John 10, John chapter 10, 10 video open the door to another masterpiece that operates 24/7, 365 inches below feet. Enjoy the journey. Since its launch in 1991, the World Wide Web has helped connect Earth's human population like no other invention in history. And every moment we use it to inform and entertain, shop and sell, educate, teleconference, play games, manage money, conduct research, share ideas, subscribe, create, invent, travel, encourage, strategize and converse with individuals, organizations, and businesses almost anywhere on the planet. Today, the web connects an estimated 5 billion people. But it isn't the only way living organisms interact on a massive scale. In fact, it's possible the World Wide Web may actually pale in comparison to another global network that's much older, larger, and perhaps even more crucial to the future of life on Earth. So put on some hiking boots and grab a flashlight, because we're about to explore a remarkable display of communication and connection, where digital code and fiber optic cables are replaced by the extraordinary power of mushrooms. Though usually small, stationary, and unobtrusive, mushrooms are the most visible components in a hidden network with the power to connect every tree in a forest. Biologically, they're classified as fungi, and their primary components are slender filaments called hyphae. These densely packed threads create the basic structure of a mushroom stem and cap, but their importance doesn't end here. Below ground level, the hyphae fan out and merge to form mycelium, living, growing colonies of fungal strands. These concentrated filaments are so dense and tightly compacted that 200 miles of mycelium fibers can be covered by a single footstep. Each hyphae strand is loaded with enzymes designed to break down, absorb, and recycle the chemical nutrients stored in soil and dead wood. Then they deliver their precious cargo to living organisms throughout the forest. Now, let's consider what's happening here on a macro scale. There are an estimated three trillion trees on our planet. And each is anchored and sustained by a system of roots. Right above them, clusters of mushrooms instantly pop into view as their mycelium fibers branch out in every direction. And when these strands attach to the roots, they create a sprawling array of pipelines known as mycorrhizal networks. The stage is now set for a dazzling performance.
When sunlight hits the leaves, it triggers photosynthesis, a chemical process that generates not only the oxygen we breathe, but also the sugar molecules the tree must manufacture and consume. These carbohydrates are distributed throughout the tree's limbs and trunk before reaching the roots and a subterranean factory that's skillfully engineered and a wonder to behold. Here, just inches below the surface, a web of fungi and wood efficiently perform a series of vital transactions. As mycelium fibers thinner than the diameter of a human hair bore into tree roots to siphon off sugar molecules, the fungi's primary source of energy. In return, the fungi supply the tree with water and nutrients, including phosphorus, zinc, calcium, copper, and organic nitrogen. Simply stated, the fungi help feed the trees, while the trees nourish the fungi. But there's another level of interaction going on below these limbs, leaves, and trunks. A crucial exchange of chemical resources, not only back and forth between the trees and the fungi, but also between the trees and their neighbors, using fungi as a highway. Researchers have nicknamed this network of biological links the Wood Wide Web. The name's both catchy and appropriate, for many biologists now believe at least 90% of our planet's vegetation is connected by complex webs of fungi and roots. That means entire forests could be unified through an underground grid that enables individual trees to share resources, transmit warnings, and relay information. Here's a quick glimpse at a few of the documented collaborations that reveal how trees can often work together. The tallest, oldest trees in a forest are known as hubs or mother trees. That's because evidence now indicates they're equipped to actually nurture their seedlings. In controlled experiments, using radioisotopes to trace the connections, it appears that hub trees send their offspring shipments of carbohydrates by pumping excess sugar through the mycorrhizal network. For a seedling that struggles to find adequate sunlight in a heavily shaded forest, a steady flow of essential nutrients dramatically improves the young tree's chances of survival. How effective are these family ties? In a small 30 by 30 meter parcel of Canadian forest, DNA analysis and fungal mapping revealed that one Douglas fir hub was linked to at least 47 of its progenies by root and mycelium connections. Researchers have also discovered that dying trees release large quantities of their stored nutrients into the soil for future access by their healthy neighbors. While different species like paper birch and Douglas fir also exchange nutrients based on their specific seasonal needs, birches deliver sugars to shaded firs in the summer. And in the fall, the firs return the favor by sending nutrients to the leafless birches. In another study, an adult pine that was attacked by insects sent chemical warning signals to its neighbors through its roots and fungi. In response, the surrounding trees released defensive enzymes to protect themselves from invasion.
Science is only beginning to understand the inner workings and importance of mushrooms, mycorrhizal networks, and the wood wide web. But recent discoveries are fascinating and important. Since Darwin, biologists have generally viewed trees as disconnected loners, constantly competing for water, nutrients, and sunlight. In an evolutionary battle, where only the strongest organisms survive. Today, however, a rapidly growing body of evidence challenges that theory by revealing vast ecosystems of vegetation and fungi, each thriving together in cooperative, mutually beneficial relationships. While part of a global network of roots and mycelium fibers that if laid end to end, would span nearly half the width of the Milky Way galaxy. It is a magnificent creation that speaks clearly of design, purpose, and a transcendent mind who made the Earth a living planet, perhaps unique from any other in the universe. That is just one of the clips I get from an organization called John 1010. So John, there's 10, 10. They send them through regularly and they're absolutely incredible. They're on creation and Tim Standish, he's the um, head of the Geoscience Institute in, at Loma Linda University. He often works with these people. So if you want to get any of those clips, just look up John 1010 and they're absolutely incredible. And one of them I watched that talks about how trees talk to each other and especially if there's a bushfire coming. The trees send out messages or their danger and they send them out. It's quite incredible. So King Charles is not that silly when he was talking to his plants. He must have known something. Cause, and when we did a creation service once before, I remember Charlie had to do a talk on, they had discovered that flowers, when they hear a bee, they make a lot of pollen just as the bee is coming and they keep making pollen until the bee leaves to keep it there longer. God was an absolute master designer and he did it all. Thank you. Yes, uh, can we all please stand for our next hymn, hymn number 92, This Is My Father's World. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees. Of skies and seas, his hand the wonders brought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. Shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems of so strong. God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let 
the heavens ring, God reigns, let the earth be glad. Good morning, everyone. We have a very special video to watch, but before we see it, I want you all to listen very, very intently to Solomon's words. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, and these words are extremely pertinent for our topic today on ancient civilizations. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. The things that have been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There is new, no new thing under the sun. There is anything which is which it may be said. See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which is before us. There is no remembrance of former things that are to come with those that shall come after. Do you really understand that? So any invention or anything new today or in the future is not new. It was known before the flood. People were geniuses and lived up to 900 years plus years and were so much taller, stronger and clever than we could ever imagine. And those incredible inventions would be forgotten by people who came many centuries later. the Mediterranean and look at one of the great civilizations of old, ancient Egypt. Now when we think of Egypt, we tend to think of the Sphinx and the pyramids and things like that, and those are fantastic. Those are amazing. But Egypt has some other very curious mysteries. If you go up along the Nile, you'll come across an ancient town called Abydos, and there is an old, old temple that predates anything that anybody ever knows. Look at one of the not the pillars, but look at one of the supports carved into this temple. What do you think, and I can't point now because this, this, the pointer won't work, but look in the upper left corner, the upper left portion. What does that machine look like? A helicopter, right? Look to the right of it. What does that look like? Like a submarine, right? And below the submarine? Some sort of a jet fighter? What about the one below that? Doesn't that look like something from the Jetsons? Daughter, Judy, remember that? Okay, anyway. I have no idea what these things are. But I will tell you, you can go online and you can see whole cults that have built up around this. One cult I read with, I read with a degree of humor, but I, I mean, it's also kind of sad when you think about it. Professing themselves to be wise. Saw it. Those Hindu people lived in absolute fear and horror every single day and night. At night, their dreams are filled with horror and nightmares because this, this is rife with demonic activity. The only thing I could think of when I saw that was that when Moses took his staff to, indis to indicate the power of God and he threw it on the ground and it turned into a serpent, what does the Bible say happened next? The pharaohs, uh, what do they call them, the... the the magicians or whatever, with their secret arts, did the same thing with air sticks. A grave in Central America, which I talked about last night, that's the evidence. There were the Maya people. We were fascinated with it. And, and it looks like it was made for a race of giants. And if you look at how the city is positioned, I'm sorry, I think it's about, maybe it's 13,000 feet. Anyway, it's way up there. And uh, it looks like everything was huge. The gateway is sitting on a slab that weighs 100 tons, it's estimated to be. And so they said to the locals, look, we, f we see where the quarry is, 60 miles away over the Andes Mountains. How in the world did your ancestors get these huge rocks over the Andes Mountains to here? And the answer kind of baffled them. And nobody believes it, nor do I, but it's interesting. 
Our ancestors used to be able to move things with the aid of sound. The aid of what? Sound. What do you mean by that? We don't know. That's what the stories are. Now, could that be just wildly embellished? We don't know. What does it mean, the aid of sound? Park yourself at that mystery and at that kind of impossibility and that sort of tongue-in-cheek, oh yeah, the aid of sound. Park yourself there for a moment and come with me to Baalbek, Lebanon. You and I can't go there today because it's an Islamic hotbed, but that's the great thing about the internet. You can email people and they can take pictures for you and send them to you. You're looking at the world's largest megalith. Look at that thing. It's a huge, huge stone being cut there. This thing is 14 feet by 16 feet by 66 feet long. Conservative estimates say that it weighs over 1,200 tons. There is not an engineer alive today that knows how to move a stone that big. Doesn't make any difference how you slice it. It defies laws of physics. You can't move a stone that big. And so somebody might say, well, who said they were moving it? Maybe they were carving something in place. Oh, they were. How do we know that? I, I wish I had a better picture of it, but look to the left of the 14-foot mark Right in the upper left of this, of this black and white picture, do you see those Roman columns there? Way off in the distance. You can see a set of about six Roman columns standing up there. That's all that's left of a building that's sitting there, which was discovered by the Roman armies when they came into Palestine. Here's the story as, as it has been passed down. The Roman armies came into this area their leading elements came across a structure that was underneath those Roman columns. They couldn't believe what they were seeing, so they called up the engineers. The engineers looked at what these leading elements were seeing, and they said, this is impossible. You cannot do this. What were they seeing that was so impossible? Now think about this. The Roman engineers were no slouches. The Roman engineers built things that are still being used all over Europe to this day. When we, when we were in Portugal, I was speaking in Portugal, when we were coming underneath this big aqueduct that still carries water for Lisbon, our driver said, oh, by the way, this aqueduct we're going under right now was built by the Romans 2,000 years ago. It's still one of the main water sources for Lisbon. So the Romans knew what they were doing. So the engineers looked at this and they said, this is impossible. What were they looking at? They were looking at three of these stones already situated in position as the foundation of an ancient building that was already fallen over. How in the world did they move the stones? So the Romans thought, whoa, the only thing this could be is a god. A god could do this. So we'd better appeal to and, and appease this god. We'll make our own temple on top of this structure and we'll just worship to this, this unknown God or whatever. So the story is that the Romans cleared away the debris down to the solid parts there and built their own temple there and that's all that's left of it sitting in Baalbek, Lebanon today. The question is, who moved the stones and how? Nobody knows. It, is, it will be a mystery till the end of time when God maybe tells us how they did it. What could the ancients have done, which engineers alive today do not know how to overcome the physics to keep a stone like that in place? How do you move it? It doesn't work. Let's cross over the miles and go over to China to look at one of the ancient dynasties. This is the Han Dynasty headed by Lady Dai, and Lady Dai died 100 years before Jesus Christ was born. She died something like 2,100 years ago. They knew where her tomb was. And when they were digging air raid shelters, because the Chinese have traditionally not trusted the Russians, so they were digging air raid shelters in the area where they knew her tomb was, and they discovered her tomb, they decided to open it up. They pulled out her casket, they opened it up, and there was another casket. They both pulled it out and opened it up and found another one. Eventually, they came down to her body. They got their first shock when they came down to her body by finding her body wrapped in silk. She's 2,100 years ago that she died, right? The silk wasn't the problem because many people had understood that the Chinese had pretty much con controlled the silk trade for years. What was surprising to them is what you're looking at. It's printed in a repeating printed pattern. 
indicating some sort of a printing press. What does your textbook say? Hans Gutenberg invented the printing press in what, 1451? When I was in Germany speaking, we went to Mainz to where the, the original presses were and the, the, the model of it now, it's an amazing machine. It's a very incredible machine that Hans Gutenberg made, but it's one color. What would Solomon have whispered in Hans Gutenberg's ear? Hey, Hans, very cool machine. Do you know that the Chinese had a full color one long ago? That baffled them. But then came the big mystery. They unwrapped her body very carefully, and there they found it. Her skin was still supple, her hair was still firmly rooted in her scalp, and that machine you see there was still seeing her last meal in her stomach. She died 2,100 years ago. There is not an undertaker alive today that knows how to preserve a body that well that long. How do you do it? Big mystery. Let's cross the miles over again to the west to go into the Mediterranean region. Let's look at the Piri Rice map. This is drawn by Admiral Piri Rice in 1513. He was not originating it. He was copying it from ancient maps that, that he had access to, and he's making his own map. He's drawing this on a deer skin. So he's copying this in 1513. This is now in a museum in Istanbul today, this map that you're looking at. Well, what is it? It just looks like an old map, right? But it's fairly accurate. And what it shows, if you remember the flood program this morning, it shows at one point the oceans were lower than they are today. The oceans were lower right after the flood, so you could literally have walked to any continent for a while. It shows the oceans were lower. It also shows something astounding. It shows the accurate coastline of Antarctica. We did not figure out the actual coastline of Antarctica till the 1950s. Why? Because when you look at Antarctica, it looks like the continent is ending here. But in some cases, you're looking at ice flows that have gone hundreds of miles out into the sea. We only discovered the actual edge of the continent in the 50s. This map shows it accurately. Who drew it? Who drew the originals? So a, a, a team of scientists were curious, and they decided to figure out where the meridian runs. They found that the meridian ran through Alexandria. So they thought, oh, this is an ancient Greek map. But when they looked at the symbols used and the structure of the map, they said, no, this method of cartography was completely unknown to the ancient Greeks. Their conclusion, this map even predated the ancient Greeks. Who drew it and how did it get so accurate? is a Christian and he has a program. He has some brilliant stuff for kids. I used to show that at Heritage Christian School. I went there every week for about 15 years and had a 45 minute creation lesson with the children. And that was a fantastic opportunity. And I had the children in kinder for a little while and they were a bit too young to sort of comprehend. So then I had the primary and from third class to sixth class and especially the fifth and sixth, it was absolutely incredible. And I'd show all of Mike Snavely's things. He has one on the horror of the flood and because of that program, <coughs> the other creation groups in the world will not send, sell his material because he just differs. It's absolutely ridiculous, the various creation ministries, they have different ideas and there's jealousy amongst them. But he has marvellous children things. And if you look, ask Mr Google, YouTube is brilliant now, uh, that video, Lost Secrets of Ancient Civilizations. And in the first one he had, when he talked about moving these huge big bricks, uh, rocks, he believed they moved it by sound. That's what people said. And one of the ones, I watch secular ones as well. I've been watching a, a lot lately on ancient civilizations and what the archaeologists have found. And they, 
they're very skeptical. And Mike Snavely, is, his are excellent. And what he said was, you know, when they move it by sound. And then at the end of one I watched, they said, we fear we might have to think about sound. They move it by sound. And um, when I was in Port Macquarie, when I did one of the programs at the end, we were looking at sound and Wayne, who worked the technology, he Googled and found it, that they're now doing experiments with moving things by sound. Now, this is 1,200 tonne. But I watched a program yesterday also, and they said Methuselah was the oldest man here who ever lived, 969. And the importance of his name, it meant when he dies, it will come. That was the flood. And so God kept him alive. He lived longer than anyone else for those to change their heart and get on the ark. And only eight did. And I've read a lot of Bell and White and a, a lot of things, just how brilliant, brilliant the ancients were. And when they found Noah's wife's grave, she was, at the tomb was 18 foot, and she had the most incredible jewellery and things, which were ransacked and sold. It was in Turkey. And so they have moved Noah's grave to a spot that won't be found, but the people. You imagine if we have any famous scientists that get the Nobel Prize these days, they work for the most about 30 or 40 years, the very most, and then they retire. They have to go to uni first. Imagine the knowledge they get in about 40 years. But these people live to 969 years. They didn't, they used 100% of their brain. They didn't have the mutations. They won't tell you now, the latest research is we are getting 100 mutations every um, generation, and that's 30 years, 100. So they said, even if God wasn't true, the mankind would die out in another 10 generations with mutations. It doesn't matter how good the medis medical world is, we are going downhill. And the word I taught the children, can you remember, Charlie, that word that starts with E? We're going downhill. I only taught some of the older kids from here, entropy. And that means we are going downhill. Evolution teaches we are getting better and better, but we're not. We are going downhill. The Bible says in the end times there will be a burst of knowledge. Because in my mother's day, she died about 12 years ago, and when, might have been a bit longer, and she saw from the wheel right up to the first cars to aeroplanes aer and um, spaceships going to the moon in her lifetime. But before then, there was so much. that They stayed the same for so long. And it's one of the most interesting things. So if you, if you look, ask Mr. Google, there's so much on these ancient civilizations. And what did Solomon say? It'll all be forgotten. We won't remember how they did it. And there's nothing new under the sun. So I don't care what invention they come up with. If you watch these programs, the great new inventions, doesn't matter what they come up with, they had it before the flood. So we think we're pretty clever, but we're not. And we, we are fighting to stop the aging process. We can't. They live for hundreds of years. Imagine how many careers, if you had 900 years and about 40 years, you've, how many 40 years in that 900, you might decide to be a radiologist, you might decide to be a digger, out in a, build tractors, 
be an astronaut. How many job opportunities could you have in over 900 years? If you had one, it'd be boring. So we can't think. We are programmed by evolution. And I've been watching lots of programs. I was watching them on one of the... Um, I can't think... When you get to 80, your brain just falls apart. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> I'm past my use by date. And um, you just see all these programs and they're hammering, hammering, hammering global warming. And then I watch these programs where they're screaming out about the water coming up in these islands. They're going to get flooded. And then I watch these programs in America, Brazil, and all these beautiful countries, hundreds of miles of coastland with all these mansions. Doesn't the water rise over that side of the world? <laughs> Most people build on the edges. And when the Ice Age came after the flood, that's when the Aboriginals would have come to Australia four and a half thousand years ago at the very most, not 40,000 years, it's now up to 65,000 years, no, four and a half thousand years, they would have come because the water went down about 400 metres because the ice up in the top of the uh, Europe was up to 700 metres high and after the flood and the Antarctic was warm because the oceans were like a warm bath. And so anywhere up in Siberia and all around there, it was warm. So that's where the mammoths bred and there was thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands on one island alone up near Siberia. They called it Bone Island because when finally the ocean started to cool, after the volcanoes finished erupting, there were about 50,000 volcanoes and all the magna from under the sea and warmed the ocean. When it started to cool, then the ice started to move further. So the mammoths, they found over 100,000 bones on one island, it's called Bone Island. If you study creation, it's just endless. There's the most fascinating topic I have over 300 videos and unfortunately people don't use videos now. And, but you, you can just extend your brain. You can learn so much and you learn to wear biblical glasses where you see everything through the eyes of the Bible. When I watch a program now, I'm looking for evidence of the flood. And there's evidence everywhere, but unless you're taught to look for it, you won't see it. Every waterfall is caused from when the flood, when the water recedes, it goes through at incredible speed and it forms the cliffs for the waterfall. If you have a look at Washington State, that coolie, Lake, uh, somewhere there, the geologists there went and found it in the early 1900s, the evidence of flood, floods, and he was hounded by this clever geologist in New York, and they said there's no catastrophic things, didn't happen, and so he lost his job and he was ridiculed for about 40 years. No one would believe him. Cooley Lakes, I think, up in Washington State on the left up in America, you see incredible evidence for the flood and one day a group of them were going to a meeting and they decided to go and look where this stupid guy um, said there was evidence of catastrophe. And as soon as they got there, they said, this is huge. It was an incredible catastrophe. And that was an ice dam that burst. So that was only a little flood. And the roar of it, if um, I'll be giving out some DVDs in the packages, and if you get the one tracking the flood, move that around, share it. It is brilliant. It tells all about the flood. And you see all these craters and things, especially in America, those great big ones, Devil Column and that, and they all come down straight. 
but then they go out like that. You see every one and you see every cliff. It comes down and then goes like that. They are all the little shards. They're like tiles. They're called talus. And the little cracks in the rock, when the weather changes, hot and cold, they cause little hairline fractures in the rocks and they split off and they fall down. So around the bottom, you watch when you're watching TV, you'll watch the edge of a cliff will coming down like that. And that proves we're not millions of years old because the rock would have eroded away. So I'll stop rabbiting on about that and we'll go on. We're going to do... Oh, the next video, I had to tell you, they're not Christians. So they'll come up with some pretty wild theories. Mike Snavely was a Christian. This next one, these people are finding these discoveries and when they first put them on YouTube, one of the groups, they got absolutely blasted and they put them on... That's right, first they put them on Netflix and they threatened... People threatened to take them down. They said, how dare they put so much rubbish? And it was the things they have found that show the ancients were brilliant. And you can't say that. You just can't say it. So there you go. Dear, you're next. Amelia's got her little talk. Yes. Oh, it went there. Which one did you have? Oh, that's right. Yes, you've done it right. Thank you. Can you see that? It is here, yeah. Yes, so we'll have the next video. Now, this one, remember, I've just... I had to cut it in in a section, and this one um, is not a Christian, but listen to his last sentence. It's very interesting. and And it's 26 seconds. Avec des cires, des fils, avec peut-être plus évolué encore que l'Égypte. And finer than the brown limestone that is found at the center. For the megalomaniac Khufu present this would also mean that the other pyramids are octagonal for the same reasons. This is not insignificant. It means they had to alter 90 centimeters at the base of the Great Pyramid, which on 115 meters both ways implies moving each block less than half a degree and repeating that on each side. And the higher up you go, the smaller the angle gets. As if it were not hard enough to pile up 203 layers of different heights in a single pyramid, making it even harder with the precise cardinal alignments. You should not confuse the two methods for pointing north, which can be achieved at night by aligning a string to a star, or at the equinoxes by observing shadows. With this whole building's orientation, that requires constant verifications to achieve only a tiny minimal error of 0.05 degrees for such a big building. That is nothing. To recap, approximately 4,500 years ago, people carved into the bedrock of a plateau an underground chamber 30 meters deep, on top of which was built a 230 meter side square with only a two centimeter variation, where 140 meters of blocks were piled up by using two million blocks of limestone of an average weight of 1.5 tons each in 203 layers of different heights forming an eight-sided pyramid totally centered and aligned with the four cardinal points with modern precision. This subterranean chamber is now connected to a narrow hall approximately one meter in height by one meter wide and 100 meters long, angled at precisely 26 degrees that connects to another just as narrow hall leading to a 50 meter long chamber 8.5 meters high, the most spectacular chamber in this pyramid. This chamber leads to an empty room on one side with an empty statue niche where nothing was ever found, roughly in the middle of the room, but perfectly aligned with the central access of the pyramid. The top of this chamber leads to an antechamber that has a security system that is totally useless, with another narrow hall leading to a chamber made of granite blocks that weigh between 12 and 70 tons on the ceiling, 
that were transported from 900 kilometers away to build a double square shaped room that is precisely horizontal and vertical, pierced by two narrow tunnels close to 40 meters long, where the only object present is a tank where no mummy was ever found. All this to satisfy the megalomania of a king done in 20 to 25 years by 2,000 workers with the help of peasants four months a year. Based on these observations, it seems rational and safer to admit that history simply forgot how and why this pyramid was built, because nothing, absolutely nothing, proves that this pyramid is a tomb. But if the Great Pyramid is not a tomb, what is it? First, it's a geometrical object with specific proportions, pi and the golden ratio. For example, this dimension divided by this one gives us pi. The visible surface of the Great Pyramid, the four sides, divided by the invisible surface or base, gives us the golden ratio. The visible height divided by pi is equal to the total height multiplied by the squared golden ratio, etc. But for Egyptology, since Egyptians didn't know about these numbers, their mere presence is an accident. So you can imagine that bringing up the meter in this context is so surprising that it gets immediately rejected, with the justification that if you work on the numbers, you will always find whatever you want. On le retrouve notamment en Egypte sur un certain nombre de blocs qui ont été mesurés euh, avec, le, euh, avec euh, des pointeurs laser comme celui-là, sur lesquels, effectivement, on retrouvait le mètre. Pourquoi le mètre se retrouve euh, en récurrence sur certains blocs euh, dans une région du monde et dans une autre This point brought up in the previous films might be the most problematic because everybody knows the Egyptians knew nothing about metric measurements. Are we really sure? Of course. First, because Egyptians measured in cubits. Second, because the meter was invented in 1795, thousands of years after the Great Pyramid. If the meter was not already determined by our ancestors way before our time, then this is an extraordinary coincidence. Close to 2500 BCE, using a measuring system called the Royal Cubit, supposed to be the measurement from the elbow to the tip of the fingers of a king, the Egyptians built the highest ancient stone building, 440 cubits wide at its base and 280 cubits high. As we previously mentioned, we note the presence of these two numbers that the Egyptians were not supposed to know. 3,500 years later, in France, the cathedral, church, and castle builders used the Keen as a five-unit measuring system. Five different units that are organized around the golden ratio, whose sizes may vary from one region to another. French royalty eventually imposed a single measurement, the medieval royal Keen. It just happens that the royal medieval cubit, which is part of the Keen, has exactly the same length as the royal cubit used for the Great Pyramid 3,500 years earlier. Let's follow this lead. Towards the end of the 17th century, the great Isaac Newton, who demonstrated the existence of gravity, sensed a link between the dimensions of the Great Pyramid and the Earth. 1781, in a book dedicated to the King of France, the mathematician Alexis Jean-Pierre Pocton also brings up a link between the dimensions of the Great Pyramid and the Earth, which is yet to be measured precisely. 1795, the meter is invented. Its value is established at one full rotation of the Earth divided by 40 million. To achieve that, the distance between Dunkirk and Barcelona was precisely measured, which gave us the value of the meter as we know it. Such a specific value that it will still take close to two more centuries to realize that by chance, the meter shines in on certain enigmatic constructions on our planet, built centuries and sometimes millenniums prior. Although they govern the mathematical relations between the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, these two numbers were supposedly unknown to their builders. Then, thousands of years later, French royalty established the use of the same cubit as used in the Great Pyramid. The coincidence doesn't stop there. The first coincidence takes place in France, where the royal span linked to the medieval cubit is precisely 20 centimeters. Five spans is precisely equal to one meter, which seems meaningless, but apparently miraculously this connects these two measuring systems and brings us to a second coincidence. The medieval cubit is 0.5235 meters, one-sixth of pi. The third coincidence occurs in Egypt. Just as the royal medieval cubit is the same length as the cubit used in the Great Pyramid, which is one-sixth of pi in meters, with the value attributed to one meter, certain dimensional ratios of the Great Pyramid give us pi and the golden ratio directly readable in meters thousands of years before the meter was defined. The 
fourth coincidence occurs this time in Bolivia with again the value attributed to a meter. Eight shaped blocks on the pre-Inca site of Pumapunku are exactly one meter long and one meter high with other measurements that are a whole number ratio of a meter. The fifth coincidence is in Easter Island, related to the Giza Plateau and many other enigmatic sites from the past on the Great Circle, where once again, because of the value given to a meter, the distance between Easter Island and Giza is 10,000 times the golden ratio in kilometers. 100 times pi in meters, 10 times pi in meters, 10,000 times the golden ratio in kilometers. If the size of the Earth were divided by any other number than 40 million, none of this would have ever existed. So what, some people may still ask. To determine the meter, you have to have measured Earth. Who was capable of doing that so long ago? Put all these coincidences together and you get the most enigmatic tomb ever built on the planet. If some people stick to the hypotheses of workers armed with wooden tools, ropes, and miraculous coincidences, we have chosen to not believe anything. Convinced that science will recognize science, we decided to use the latest technology to verify our intuition. Especially when far, very far from Egypt, the choice of the meter produces a sixth coincidence. This time in India, in the cave of Sudama, on the site of Barbar. Its dome is six meters in diameter, with a segment of a sphere three meters in radius, with its center at one meter above ground. All this because in 1795, we decided to invent the meter and gave it a specific value that thousands of years later shine a new light on ancient masterpieces of engineering for which we have no documentation and no memory. Since the royal cubit was transmitted, why not the meter? Maybe miracles do exist, but when they come together in rocks that are so hard with such precision, it isn't magic anymore. It is science. In the previous film, we presented the results of the 3D scans that revealed high precision symmetry, but at that point, we hadn't yet measured this precision. In late February 2020, we filmed the complete debriefing of the analysis of the scans by an engineer from the AGP company, and then went back to Barabar in March to verify what we had missed. Here again, everything started with an intuition when we first visited these caves. Enfin, ça n'a pas été fait au laser. Ça, c'est fait à la main. Et il faut des milliers et des milliers d'heures pour obtenir un, un travail comme celui-là. Having noticed a huge gap between what has been published on these caves and our own observations, we decided to go back and scan them in 3D. Ouais, un glacé superbe hein, qui est obtenu par un, un ponçage de, de la surface, qui est très difficile à obtenir avec un ponçage avec une, euh, classique, avec une roche euh, et de l'eau, mais qu'on peut obtenir plus facilement avec une, euh, un sable fin abrasif, très très fin. On a, une, on a une brillance équivalente à ce que l'on obtient aujourd'hui avec les techniques modernes. It's the same as in Pumapunku, with no measurements. I thought I'd stop it because time is marching on and we have our final hymn and then I have the bags to give out um, because I want the families to take home something to learn. This is really, really important. And the sentence he said at the end of that was, they have worked out, we are working with a civilization with amnesia that the world has forgotten. That's exactly what Solomon said. They have forgotten. We do not have a clue how they built things in the past. Entropy, we are going downhill. All right, can you all please stand for our final hymn, Joyful, Joyful.